All right, continuing with this July 4th edition of Reading Through Acts, and uh, it's not July 4th right now, but it will be before long. And anyway, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, continuing from chapter 1, we're going to be talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And these are going to be speaking of the events uh, that happened at the day of Pentecost and this is where the Pentecostals get their uh, name from. They think that they are the church uh, that originated from the day of Pentecost. And uh, this is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit came that Jesus spoke of. And the Pentecostals are all about the Holy Spirit. And we should be all about the Holy Spirit, but they're all about a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. Anyway... And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. All the uh, disciples and all the people, I think, that were spoken of before, the 120 or 140 or however many it was. And when I was thinking about that, I was talking about how there was some controversy with the Church of Christ or something. I think it continues on with this, and maybe there's some discrepancy between chapter, chapter 1 and chapter 2. There's some debate of... Uh, there's some differences there. And anyway, I'll continue and we'll see when we get to that. If that's there, Acts chapter 2, verses, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And so I've, I've talked before how it's interesting if I did studies, and I know there's been lots of studies done on it before, I'm sure, but the senses in the Bible, and there's lots of sounds, obviously, that are spoken of a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, which I think that would be it's a, a metaphor or a simile where uh, the sound is, is like a mighty rushing wind. Um, but, or anyway, yeah, that's what they heard. Anyway, it, it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as like as, fi as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now that's very interesting. It appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that's very mysterious how, you know, what it's, it says that it appeared unto them like cloven tongues like as fire. A fire. Uh, that's something I would like to look into more, some different ideas of what that means. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so a lot of people uh, believe that, you know, speaking in other tongues means speaking in other languages, where the Pentecostals think that it means speaking in a heavenly language, a language that, uh, you know, no one understands apart from, you know, an interpreter, someone who has the gift of interpretation, of uh, interpreting this heavenly language. But I think it's uh, better to be understood as different languages that were known of men. But anyway, this happened when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and... Um, And, uh, and this is an empowerment, so a lot of different views on, you know, the filling of the Holy Ghost and, um, the indwellment. And, you know, people think, well, in the Old Testament, believers weren't indwelled with the Holy Spirit, um, which is wrong. You know, they were born again in the Old Testament. They were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. These men and, and women that already believed, that already had faith, that were already saved, they were already indwelt with the Holy Spirit. This is the of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about a, an, an empowerment. Um, <clears throat> and just like, you know, the kings were empowered by the Holy Spirit, like David. And, you know, when when he was saying, take not thy spirit from me, you know, it was taking uh, this empowerment like it was taken from Saul. And, and it could other it could mean, you know... You know, not to not to abandon him. He, he just felt like like maybe God, maybe those were just his feelings. But God would never truly abandon um, his believers anyway. So there's other ways to look at it. But I mean, it's it's the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's not the indwelling. It's not saying that they weren't regenerated or they weren't born again at, until this point. Okay, and that's something else that the Pentecostals 
believe differently on. They think that not everyone is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So, anyway, um, they spoke in different tongues. And in verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. In verse 6, Now when this noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confused, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They're saying that there were Jews there from all over these different regions, and they spoke different languages. And when the Holy Spirit came upon the, the apostles, uh, they spoke in these languages, uh, you know, that they probably they didn't know, but they were speaking in them like fluently, and these uh, these Jews that were from the different nations, they heard, you know, their language being spoken. And they were amazed and they were marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So right there, you know, we see that they're speaking it in the different languages. It has nothing to do with the heavenly uh, language. And there's the verses in Corinthians too, where maybe, you know, maybe they have Maybe the Pentecostals think there's both. They're speaking in, in different languages known to man, and they're speaking in the heavenly language. But it's it's all um, got to be, I think, in, in earthly languages. But anyway, you know, that stuff that I focused on early being saved a lot was all of this Pentecostal stuff because I was going to the Assembly of God. So I looked into that stuff so much. But I think there's a lot of bigger fish to fry when it comes to doctrines and stuff. But that's just kind of a strange thing that they believe these things. So, anyway, Acts 2, verse 8, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? I read that. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, I don't know how those are pronounced, and the dwellers at Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Phrygia, I don't know, Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya about Korean, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all speaking, uh, praising of God. They're probably speaking the gospel, talking about Jesus, the resurrection and all that. Um, and... And they were speaking languages from all these different areas that were listed. And uh, in verse 12, and they were all amazed, the, the Jews who, who weren't believers, who heard this stuff, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And uh, verse 13, others mocked, saying these men are full of new wine, saying they were drunk. So they were still... Uh, being unrepentant in their heart. They were still being, you know, they were still not uh, taking it in, so some of them. Now it talks about sermon, Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 15, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, saying it's, it's too early that they're not drinking. Um, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. See, it's saying this is spoken of in Joel, uh, referencing to that. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and, uh, you know, And again, you know, it seems like I'll pour out your spirit, my spirit on all flesh. Makes it seem like, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't around in the Old Testament or something like that in, in believers. But, you know, this is a, a speaking of an empowerment. 
And, you know, all flesh could mean that, you know, the gospel is going to the Jews and the Gentiles. But um, they're focusing on, right now, you know, it's talking about the Jews. They're, you know, all most of the people that are probably saved were Jews, and they were, they were preaching to the Jews. So this is before, you know, the gospel really went to the Gentiles. But your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your men shall see visions, and your men shall dream dreams. Which is interesting. And, uh, anyway, uh, something interesting too, just something that's just coming to my mind is how in Corinthians, how it talks about, you know, a woman shouldn't preach and stuff. And then a lot of women will go to this verse where it talks about daughters prophesying and stuff. And I don't think that there's such a big issue with women preaching. I think there's, you know, certain circumstances and senses and, and which it is, but, you know, a lot of the controversy comes with the church buildings and should a woman lead, you know, a church building. But I don't really, you know, I don't go to a church myself. And so I believe a lot of things differently than that anyway. But uh, I know there's a lot of controversy around those things. But I know I know people will appeal to this passage a lot saying, yes, women, you know, God says that women will prophesy and uh, or basically preach. Because we see in the New Testament a lot that, uh, you know, prophecy has to do with preaching. Um, but, you know, it also talks about seeing visions and seeing dreams. Um, you know, and what are these things too? And it could be speaking of, you know, like John sees the vision of, you know, in Revelation, you know, of Armageddon and stuff, and... The apocalyptic visions, I guess, and you know, was it Peter sees a vision of you know when when they go to the Gentiles and uh, he sees like all the unclean meats or whatever the unclean animals. Uh, so there's there's visions in those senses too, and, and I'm sure there are dreams. I can't think of right now, but. Um, and it's really questionable, you know, are people seeing visions and dreams today and stuff? You know, that has to do a lot with the Pentecostal stuff, too, to where we have to use discernment. And uh, it's interesting, you know, the whole Pentecostal church and, and people that have beliefs similar to that are all wrapped up in the dreams and the visions. And a lot of them put scripture to the side um, for their visions. And... Uh, think that's kind of dangerous but anyway very interesting stuff and <clears throat> and on my servants and on my hands handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy And we see kind of that's an, that it's an empowerment too, because he's talking about pouring out my spirit, and then he's talking about they will prophesy, they will see visions, they will see dreams, they will, again, they will prophesy. So he's saying, you know, the Holy Spirit will empower them or, you know, lead them in doing these things. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and in signs at earth, and the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now that's very interesting too because I think a lot of people apply these things to the end times. And I think there's different ways to look at it. And uh, he's reading basically what was from uh, Joel. And he's, he's reading all of this saying, you know, this is happening now basically. And so um, I might have touched on some of this stuff before. I'm going to have to look into it before I can say much really. But, um, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. You know, a lot of people want to take this literally. Obviously, it's easy to do that. Um, but, um, I don't know. Before I really comment on much, the, you know, this is definitely something I want to look into again about that stuff, those two verses, 19 and 20. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah. Seems to say like that stuff is, is happening, you know, is beginning to happen then. 
And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's obviously Acts 2, 21. That's a very popular verse right there, very simple. And one that refutes Calvinism. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Acts 2.22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, meaning God the Father. This doesn't mean that Jesus was not God. He did signs and miracles written in the Gospels. Very popular. We know those things, which God did by him in the midst of you. Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Okay. It was determined that Jesus would be slain, and uh, God knew it was going to happen. Um, so, Acts 2.24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be behold beholden of it. Because he is the Son of God. He is divine. And so speaking of the resurrection, speaking of the, the death and the resurrection, he's given them the gospel. He's telling them who Jesus was. And um, uh, you know, I was just thinking about the determination part of it, how, how it's determined. And um, You know how Calvinism says that God determines everything. We know that, uh, you know, God knew that He was going to send Jesus to be slain for the sins of the world. But, you know, and it's like, okay, if God determined this would happen, then, like, everything else has to be determined or whatever. You know, no, nobody had free will because, you know, if they had free will, then it could have been possible that maybe, you know, the crucifixion wouldn't have happened. But that's not true. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, so sometimes it's, you know, I, I don't want to get into a lot now, but it's just, we have to, um, you know, think about how free will works within, you know, the crucifixion being determined and, and such. Uh, it's interesting, but. Anyways, the way that Calvinism goes about it is totally wrong. Um, so God raised him up, loosed the pains of death. Um, Acts 2.25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Saying that, you know, in the Psalms, you know, was spoken of Jesus. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. You know... It's interesting. I'm just thinking as I as I'm reading this, um, how where it says, "Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell," which is controversy too. Some people, like Stephen Anderson, actually believe that Jesus went to hell, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But you know, I think David's talking about himself that that you know God will not leave him in hell. That uh, basically. Meaning, you know, maybe not even necessarily, you know, the place of the damned, but basically just, you know, God's not going to forsake him, basically. And then, and then he says, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So, speaking of, you know, the holy one to see corruption, speaking of Jesus, where, you know, leave not my soul in hell, is David talking about himself. And, uh, but anyway, I don't know. I'm just, I, I've, 
<laughs> I've only had a little bit of sleep too, so sorry, I'm kind of like all over the place, but this is either way, you know, just, it, it means that, you know, Jesus was going to be resurrected. He wasn't going to, um, you know, be dead. Uh, so, or that, you know, his body wasn't going to rot, you know. Uh, okay. That's one of those verses in Acts, so that, that I think about a lot is one of those ones I've went to a lot. I've already made videos on that stuff. Acts 2.28, Thou hast made me to, has made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Acts 2.29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now, I've talked about this recently, how Christ is sitting on the throne right now, and this is what David is saying. That, um, you know, Jesus was one of the descendants of David, and he, uh, it was prophesied that he would be risen to sit on the throne of David, and so the, the, the throne of David is in heaven. Um, verse 31, he's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Okay. <clears throat> this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And so even though in verse 31 he says again that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, he could say, um, it could still be, you know, his soul was not left in hell, it could be referring to David, and that his flesh did not see corruption, or... Neither did his flesh see corruption, could be referring to Jesus, um, but, or, you know, both referring to Jesus, either way, you know, whatever. It's, I'm just saying that that's an interesting way that it could be taken to. But he's, he's saying that, you know, David was sp speaking of Jesus in his prophecy, either way, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all our witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. And so he's saying he's sitting at the right hand of God, exalted, meaning he is sitting on the throne. He is um, reigning as king, sitting on the throne of David in heaven. And so he appeals to you know, you saw the things that Jesus did. You were you were there. You've heard you've heard of it. You've seen it. The miracles that he did. You know, he says that this is the Jesus that was spoken over the resurrection. So he he appeals to the miracles that Jesus did. He appeals to the scriptures. He appeals to you know basically the things that are going on now. Their empowerment of the Holy Spirit with their speaking in different languages. Uh, so he's combining all these different evidences of the, these proofs that Jesus was the Son of God and is the Son of God. Uh, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Um, that's also, he appealed to the resurrection, so he appeals to the miracles, the scriptures, the resurrection, you know, the, the current empowerment. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou right, sit thou on my right hand. until I make thy foes thy footstool. So and that's something interesting I might have talked about before. I don't know, but it kind of boggles my mind right now reading it, that David is not ascended into the heavens. It doesn't mean that David did not go to heaven when he died, or that he was not in heaven when they, when he spoke this. 
Um, but maybe, maybe that David wasn't in heaven when he wrote this, when he wrote the Psalms. Um, so it's saying, you know, it had to be David speaking, you know, of the, the Lord, not of himself. But anyway, verse 35 says, Until I make thy foes thy footstool, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, so God the Father made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, the Jews, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Savior. I'm oh, sorry. Wow, this is a long chapter. It's chapter 2. I lost my place. So, okay. Uh, let's see here. Wow. It's that long sermon of Peter. This is an awesome uh, sermon here. It's one to go back to a lot. Let's see. Where was I? Okay. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, this is where the Church of Christ would takes their baptism doctrine where you know you have to be baptized to be saved because they see repentance and baptism for the remission of sins. So they think, well, you have to be baptized for the remission of sins. But that's not what it means. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so repentance is obviously uh, involved there. So these Jews were... Uh, I don't know, I can't think of the word for it right now. Anyway, you know, they wanted, they, they, they had a turn, they had a change of mind, they wanted to, uh, you know, they felt repentant, and uh, they wanted to uh, be accepted into the kingdom of God, basically. They wanted to be forgiven for, you know, their blindness, their rejection of the scriptures. Acts 2.39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this is, this is for all. And uh, I could talk about Calvinism again. You know, where this basically says that, you know, um, anybody can receive salvation, basically. And, you know, but then it says, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And they'd probably say, well, you know, only as many as he calls, you know, only as many as he has determined can be saved or whatever. But God calls all. You know, it's not limiting it to, to any anything. It's saying, you know, all of them. Anyone can receive salvation. And with many other words that you testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added to, unto them about 3,000 souls. See the fellowship of the believers. And we're almost at the end of the chapter. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and, and breaking of bread and in prayers. And uh, I've always liked that verse, too, talking about fellowship, how, you know, the scriptures were important, and just the general fellowship and prayers. They were praying together. They were reading the scriptures together. They were just enjoying one another's company and uh, growing together, and they were eating together, breaking of bread. Um, so they were sharing in all these things, spiritual, you know, and uh, 
earthly things, basically, I guess. Uh, but anyway, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And um, so I think, you know, the fear is the fear of God. Um, you know, maybe maybe it's saying, you know, how, how many men came to repentance. But, uh, you know, it's not like... Uh, I don't think it's like the apostles were, you know, the signs and the wonders they did were like frightening people or whatever, like everybody was terrified or something like, that's not what it means. It's like, you know, basically, you know, salvation was coming to people. It's the fear of God. And, um, they, uh, people were getting right with God basically. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had needed. Now that's a pretty major, you know, not something that we see today. You know, even me, uh, that would be hard to sell all your things and goods and, and go all, all together. Um, parted them to all men as every man had need. It was a lot different back then. Um, and maybe, you know, it's, it's different in different countries and stuff, but um, you know, we still donate and we still help each other out whenever we can. And, um, anyway, uh, and we still have even, you know, with churches and stuff and different, uh, organizations like the Salvation Army or whatever, we have like food baskets, food drives and stuff where people, you know, we give canned goods and things like that so you know we're still charitable in many ways but um you know they they all they all lived together and traveled together and stuff and so a little bit different um where especially in america you know there's a lot of homeless people i mean we have a homeless problem but there there still are a lot of things available to people you know shelter and food wise and stuff like that but yeah, it's, that's pretty big. You know, a lot of, we want to live by scripture and live by people's examples. And I think it's just, it's just a good example just to be charitable and stuff. You know, we don't have to go to the extremes of selling our houses and stuff. But, um, anyway, it's, it's pretty amazing to read that. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, as such would should be safe. So basically, this whole chapter is, you know, this empowerment of the Holy Spirit comes. And, you know, a ton of people get saved in one day uh, because the miracles and stuff that they see, the, you know, the wonders of the speaking in the different languages, and then Peter's sermon, which is, you know, one of the greater sermons in Scripture, you know, besides stuff that Jesus said himself, and, um, and then, you know, all the apostles continuing together, so... That is a really good chapter, if, if not just for Peter's sermon alone, Acts chapter 2. So, I'm going to continue on. That was a long chapter, so God bless.